Hi, hi everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Paula Farmer, your host and moderator tonight. Um, please, please, while we're all coming in to the event, uh, if you haven't already subscribed to the Book Passage uh, channel, please do so. That really helps us. It doesn't take much for you to do it and it really helps us out a lot. Um, thank you so much for supporting this event and our other events, uh, most of which are still virtual. Uh, we are starting to have some in-person, in-store events in San Francisco and Corte Madera. And uh, feel free to check out our website for those that are in-person and those that are virtual. If you live in the Bay Area, we welcome you to come to some of those in-person events. Um, and if you live in the Bay Area, but you live someplace else in the world, we have plenty of virtual events like the one tonight. I'm so excited about it. I don't often um, get to moderate per se events. I usually host a lot of events, but tonight is kind of special and I'm very excited about it. Um, not only because of the unique um, kind of style of the event tonight, but also the featured guest and the featured book. Uh, which obviously we're going to get into. I'm very excited. It takes on a more visual and artistic um, perspective. And um, why don't we just get started? As F. Scott Fitz Fitzgerald portrayed the mad glories of the 1920s on the printed page, Tamara de Lampica, 1898 to 1980, captured them on canvas. A seductive Garbo-esque beauty with an irresistible force of personality, this uh, refugee of the Russian Revolution, a uh, successfully conquered Paris, Hollywood, and New York. Um, she had portraits that were, um, became very valuable, are still very valuable. And over the years, her paintings have become synonymous with the Art Deco era. If you look right behind me, you'll see the cover of the book, Passion by Design authored by Tamara's own daughter, is an intimate look at a fascinating personality and remains the best account of her life and work. This new edition is illustrated with vibrant color reproductions of her finest paintings, as well as exclusive photographs from the family albums. Um, and there's a new introduction by one of our guests tonight, Marissa De La Pica, the artist's great granddaughter and it explores the ever evolving legacy of Tamara de la Limpica and her works. Marissa was raised and educated in Buenos Aires. She now serves full time as president of Tamara de Limpica Estate founded with her mother, Victoria. And she joins us from Aspen, Colorado. Julie Rubio is also joining us and she is an award-winning film producer, writer, and director known for her award-winning film, East Side Sushi, which you can see on Netflix. She is also the director of Business for Women in Film, SF Bay Area. Her new work in progress is actually a feature length documentary about Tamara and about her works. And it features uh, Marisa and her mother, Victoria. So please welcome to the Book Passage virtual stage, Julie and Marisa. Hello, Paula. Nice. Hi. Hello. Thank you for having us. This is Thank a huge you so for great this. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Oh, thank you for agreeing to do this. I'm so excited. We have a film maker and we have someone has contributed to this very important book and knows personally the work and the challenges of this margin, marginalized artist. And we're gonna get into all of that, I'm so excited. Um, Marisa, I'm gonna start with you. Can you give our audience, who maybe many aren't so familiar with your great grandmother, um, kind of a sense of who she was personally and her work, uh, including approximation of the year she started in her artwork and came into prominence, um, basically her journey and her struggles. 
Yeah. Well, you did a great job introducing her. I think that's a like a great summary. Um, I knew Tamara, Tamara personally. I was lucky enough. Uh, I met her as a little girl. She would invite us to her villa in Mexico. So I, I really um, had a firsthand uh, relationship and then just uh, was able to 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 feel her presence, her her amazing presence. But Tamara, as she's being called the Art Deco diva, the Queen of Modern, uh, she's best known for her Art Deco portraits. But it's important to know that she did paint her whole life. Um, she started when she was she was extremely talented. We have some of her works from when she was only a child, probably 12 or 13 years old. You could already see that she was such a talented uh, uh, in her drawings and her, her watercolors. Um, so she had an innate talent from, from a young age. Um, as you well said in your introduction, she had to escape uh, the, the Russian Revolution while living in, in St. Petersburg. She actually saved her husband from the Bolshevik jail. And uh, I know Julie's gonna talk a little bit about that in, in her documentary, but she was only 19 and she was able to secure his uh, um, safety passage out of the Bolshevik jail. So they end up in, in, in Paris pretty much penniless, they lost, she came from a quite a, a wealthy family, Polish Russian family. And uh, after the, the, the revolution, they pretty much escaped with the, the jewels that they could pin in their clothes and, and end up in, in Paris, almost penniless. Tamara starts painting um, thanks to her sister, uh, her name is Adriana Gorska, and she was a uh, she was already studying architecture, and she suggested Tamara uh, become a painter because she had uh, that innate talent. And eventually, Tamara she she studies at uh, the Academie de la Grande Chaumière in Paris with uh, André Lot, the father of soft cubism, and uh, Morris Dennis, and she eventually becomes the most sought after portrait painter of her day. Uh, she's able to. To, um, to paint some of the most famous people of the day, um, socialites, kings, queens, and, uh, and then she, she does some of amazing uh, and stylized nudes. She developed her own unique style. Uh, you can see it on, on the cover of the book. That's actually the outer portrait that's Tamara and the green Bugatti, but it's a, it's a mix of uh, soft cubism and her beloved Renaissance that, that she admired so much. So she, she really created her own unique style, which is, is so recogni recognizable today. And uh, she became a, a millionaire in her own right by painting these, these amazing, amazing portraits. So, so um, we say that it's from riches to rags to riches is, is her story. And, uh, and nowadays, uh, I think a, a lot of her work is very re recognizable, but a lot of people don't know about her life, don't know about her story, which is so compelling. And this is why we're so happy that Julie decided to, to create this documentary so people can know about her struggles and her successes and, and hopefully fe feel inspired by her story. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's interesting that you're mentioning like when you look at the covers, it's like, oh, the cover and the other uh, paintings inside the book, um, or you even go online and you look up things, it's like, it seems all very familiar, but definitely she's one artist I actually knew very little, if anything, about. But yet there's something very familiar about her style. And I know I've seen her paintings over the years, many, many times. Um, so I, and I, when I've, I've seen uh, Julie's trailer for the documentary and learned, um, or actually it might've been more than just a trailer. We actually got to see a little bit more than that. I, it was fascinating, her backstory, especially coming up into her art and her career when women were not really that embraced in the art world. Yes, you're, you're correct. Um, you know, of course, you name painters, you can name Van Gogh, Picasso, Dali, but very people can name more than five female painters. So 
um, again, she started painting because she had to survive. She had to, to feed her child. Her husband was a, a beaten man after the Bolshevik revolution and after being in jail. And, and, and uh, she decided to take that innate talent that she had and, and the connections, of course, that she still had from, from Russia and from, from Warsaw and use them and, and, and create them. She also was extremely brilliant at marketing and marketing herself. I think, um, you know, now we have Instagram and social media, but she understood that the way she presented herself to the world was gonna help her sell her paintings get her commission. So, you know, she was a beautiful woman, but she used fashion. She loved fashion. Uh, she always wore amazing hats. Eventually, as she started making money, she would buy herself jewelry. Um, actually, there's a story in the book that she told me when, when I was a little girl. And uh, she, she told me after, you know, after losing everything, I decided I was going to make my own money. I was going to be able to, and I was going to support myself and support your grandmother my, her daughter. And uh, she said, I would buy myself a diamond bracelet. Every time I sold a painting, I would not stop until I had diamond bracelets from here. So from the, the wrist to the elbow to here. And me as a little girl, I was so impressed. And you see some of the pictures of Tamara and she has the most amazing diamond bracelets. But that was two things. Of course, it, they were beautiful objects, but to her, it gave, it, it was a sense of safety because she knew if something ever happened again, if a war or an invasion, she could take her jewel with her to the next place and 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 start over again, which actually eventually did happen. Um, you know, with, with the, the 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 Nazi invasion of of of, of France. But uh, yes, she was. A, she, she was. A, she, she just said, she just said her de determination was amazing. And I still remember as a little girl and she was already in her late seventies, she had such a strength, like whatever she put her mind to, um, she conquered and she accomplished. And, and again, as you say, you know, women in the twenties, they didn't even have bank accounts. I mean, that was the first generation that women could actually have bank accounts that could drive, that could have a career um, that could own property. Um, you know, they cut their dresses, they cut their hair, and uh, and you know, they decided what they wanted to do with their lives, and and she certainly did that. Yeah, that's amazing. And I'd like to bring Julie in now too. Um, Julie, our uh, filmmaker, who's working on a it's a work in progress feature length documentary about your great grandmother. Um, Julie, I'd, I'd love to know how did you connect. Uh, with this, well, I should say, what may, inspired you to even take on this project as uh, a documentary film? Um, and your background is actually doing more feature length type films anyway. But, and then second part of that question, from there, how did you actually connect with Marisa and Victoria and the family? Um, I met Victoria and Marissa about 16 years ago. I had just um, finished writing a screenplay about the Impressionist painters. And I was invited to this private exhibit of Tamara's work at the Weinstein Gallery in San Francisco here locally um, in Union Square to, to meet Victoria and to meet Marissa and possibly um, there was like a possibility of me writing a narrative screenplay about Tamara's life. And I had loved Tamara's work. So I was super excited to meet them. And um, when I arrived, Marissa, and I'll never forget it, they were sitting on the couch and they, her Tamara's work was, her paintings were uh, displayed on the walls and there was just this buzz and, and amazingness in the room. And it was just such a pleasure to, uh, to see her work, but then also to meet her heirs, you know, to meet her family. And we all three sat and talked for hours and we became fast friends after that. And that seed was planted. And my dream of making this film um, was, was born. And it, it's been a wonderful working with them. And I really appreciate their, their dear friendship. And, um, you know, I just, I really hope that this documentary will help to claim Tamara de Limpica's rightful place in art history, especially here in America, like you were saying, Paula, a lot of people don't know who she is. And, you know, I feel as though we've had plenty of men always have had their moment, um, but for women, I just, I haven't seen 
this kind of a story uh, that, that is Tamara's story. And, and as I've researched her all these years, I've saw something that I had never seen before, but I knew it existed. And I, I saw through her story, so many other women's stories. Um, and she, she's just had this strong point of view and we just don't get to see such strong women on the big screen, you know, especially uh, as groundbreaking and, and brave as she, as she was. And she really um, gives women permission to, to be themselves. And so, you know, I, I think I realized after all the research, just how much pain she must have been through in her life. And then she just took all this beauty and, and she made this beautiful thing from the pain of these paintings, these creations, you know, and she really was a genius. I believe that uh, there, there's just so much, uh, you know, having to hide as, as Marissa was saying, you know, the fact that she was Jewish, having to leave both of her countries and, you know, losing her family, some of them to the Holocaust is absolutely horrible and losing her husbands and, and going through all these things. And yet, here she continued to make these beautiful paintings and take her pain and make something, you know, really, really healing and beautiful. And I think that our film showcases Tamara's groundbreaking artwork. And um, it really uncovers some newly un uh, stories, some, some uncovers some 